Well, welcome friends. My name is Tamara with Love in a Big World, and this is another edition of our LBW Educate You podcast with my dear friend, Dr. Kim Dukes. Welcome, Kim. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And would you please just give us a little bit of background about you before we dig into our topic today? Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to say that I am Kim. I am a person that loves, loves, loves being active uh, in understanding and creating new ideas for kids as far as engaging them in learning and motivating them to learn. I enjoy traveling. I enjoy uh, going out to eat at different restaurants and learning the history of the dishes that I, uh, that I try. Um, I am 33 years into education uh, as far as um, experiencing school counseling, exceptional education, urban education consultant, uh, I have a degree, uh, EDS degree in turnaround school leadership, just received my doctorate degree with uh, emphasis on uh, the effects of bullying prevention programs and social emotional learning. Wonderful. And Dr. Kim and I have worked together in various settings for over 20 years. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Love in a Big World's been around 25 years now. So, mm -hmm. awesome. So, today we're going to be talking about how we can lift up our students, our families, and our educators as we are all very weary of this pandemic yes. and experiencing a great deal of Zoom fatigue. And yes. even though the vaccinations are rolling out, we're not out of the woods quite yet. And we don't really know what the future holds. So Dr. Kim, through her work, especially through this past year, has some stories to share and some tips and strategies for us today. So we're going to start off with what are some of the pros and cons that you have seen this past year with virtual learning? Okay, let's start with the pros. I am very fortunate and um, blessed to be a part of a awesome program that's called Educational Talent Search Program. This is a TRIO program that is grant funded and free. And what we do when it wasn't a pandemic is that I have academic advisors and myself, we would actually go out into the schools and work with the students in the classroom. Due to the pandemic, we had to definitely regroup and rethink our process. And so we are now uh, invited in the classrooms virtually with the teachers and the students. So every morning, usually at seven o'clock AM, I check in just like the students and work with the students uh, doing virtual learning. What I have seen, and I've talked with the kids, and we have sessions, uh, and evening sessions around six o'clock, and they'll log in and we'll have safe space sessions where they can just talk openly. And they have shared a lot of information that they wouldn't normally share or have the opportunity to share. And I would like to share some of those things with you. Yes, please. Okay. so. Um, one thing is, keep in mind that teachers are frustrated also. Mm -hmm. Kids are not logging in to class. And those teachers care and they don't know what's going on with the child. They cannot see the child. Mm -hmm. Normally, if a child walks into a classroom and with their head down or they're angry or something is going on, they can detect that. But in virtual learning, that's really hard to detect. So when the kids are talking to us, I often relay that information to the teacher. The kids, the majority of them that we talk to, they love 
virtual learn. They like being at home because you have to think about it. A lot of them say they're not bullied at home. They feel safe. Even the cyber bullying they have shared with me is not as bad as when they were in school. Uh, they talk about one little child told me, she said, I'm a loner. She said, I, you know, I'm the only child. She said, I grew up by myself, so I'm a loner. So being at home, she said, my grades have soared. She said, I'm so happy that I have received A's and B's for the first time because I'm at home and I can learn. And those extra days that I have, she just, it helps me to figure out what I need to do. And I'm not pressured at school. I've talked to kids who have said, I don't have the pressure of having to wear a uniform to school. And sometimes my uniforms are too small or my mom didn't wash. So I've had to wear my uniform several times and kids notice that and they talk about me. But at home, I don't have to worry about that. I study in my shorts or my pajamas and they love that. So those are positive things about uh, the virtual learning. Kids love it. They like the time that they have, uh, they can ask a question without feeling embarrassed because they can send that teacher a question in Schoology. Mm -hmm. So there are some positive things about uh, virtual learning that kids have shared. I like school now where I didn't like school before. We learn differently now. You know, I can sit in the corner of my room on my bean bag, or I can stand up and walk around. And in school, I can't do that. So there are positive things about virtual learning that they have shared. Parents, also have stated with the pandemic, they're afraid. Several of them are afraid of uh, sending their kids back to school mm -hmm. and have decided, no, I don't want my child back. I'm gonna keep them at home. And that's good. Kids have shared that, wow, we have family nights now. We go hiking together. Kids have talked about, we eat at the table together. That was weird at first, one student said. No one was talking because we weren't used to sitting at the table together. Now we race to the table and we talk and we joke. I love it. I love having my family at the table with me. And we're not all eating different places or in my room. It has brought about family bonding and new relationships. Siblings are helping each other. They talk about how they help each other with their classwork, mm -hmm. where they didn't do that before. Things that we assume happened, didn't happen at first in some of these homes of the kids that we have spoken with. So there are positive things that have happened as far as family bonding. Mm -hmm during this pandemic. I love hearing that, Dr. Kim, because I've suspected that that is what has been going on, but to hear that confirmed with your own experience with the students that you serve yeah. is so heartening to me. Um, and I think about, you know, the time my kids are, are pretty big now, they're 23, 18, and 15, but I remember the times when they were younger and especially that after school time when it was hurrying to pick them up, mm -hmm. going to extracurricular activities, trying to figure out when we're gonna eat. And we made it a priority to sit at the table, but it sometimes was a challenge between dance practice and football practice and all the other things we had going on. So in some ways this slowing down really has helped us focus back on the family. Yes, yes, indeed. So I love that you've shared some of the pros. What are some of the challenges that you see with the virtual learning? Um, some of the challenges that I have seen and as I've talked with other um, 
parents and students, uh, bus attendants, mm. teachers, things that they have shared uh, with me openly. Um, I was just sharing with Tamara earlier that while sitting in a virtual classroom, at the end of that class, the teacher just started crying, just was very emotional. It was very overwhelmed and stressed um, with trying to get kids to log in. Um, she felt like she wasn't being effective. And I wanted to share with her, I wanted to give her a hug. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, but I shared with her what I had observed. She is an outstanding math teacher. And she makes sure that her kids understand the lesson taught and willing to work with them even after her class time. She is outstanding, but she was so stressed out, so upset. Kids log in, but you know, a Metro does not require them to um, show their face. I understand that. I understand the reasons. But because they are not required to show their face, oftentimes some will log in and then just walk away from uh, the camera. And in turn, they will um, oftentimes go and play a game. And we can hear it in the background where they're actually playing. Uh, on their consoles or parents are fussing in the background with an, either another sibling or a spouse or another adult mm -hmm. uh, and kids are embarrassed. Uh, that has happened, the loud noise. Kids have off, and even parents have said, I have four kids. I have one parent, she said, I have four kids and they're all trying to work at different times with different assignments. And she said, I am stressed out because I don't know what to do. I don't know where they are. I can't keep up with all of the work. I understand that. I talked to a bus attendant and she said, as they're picking up their elementary school kids, she's watching kids walk out of the door, turning off lights, turning off the porch light, and then locking the door because they have been home alone waiting for the bus. But can you imagine that child being at home all alone, all day long until the parent returns from work? An elementary child? Mm -hmm. We're talking about first through fourth grade kids mm -hmm. home alone. Some have siblings, some do not. Right. You have kids taking care of kids all day long at home. Even you have kids, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say even more so than before because we all know that that happens, but yes. when parents are essential workers and they have to go to work, so yes. they, food yes. on the table, they yes. feel like they have a choice. Correct, that is so true. So um, I was talking to one bus attendant, That's, uh, she works in Springfield, Robertson County. Mm -hmm. And of course, the elementary kids went back um, a while back for them. And she said she was glad that they were going back because they were missing so much learning. You know, yeah. the education you know, at this point, she, she just feels so sorry for them. And then think about our EL students. That's mm -hmm. another um, concern. They don't even know how to turn on or log into the computer. So all of this time, they have been just left out there with no support, no help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell us, Dr. Kim, what, what encouragement or strategies can you share with first-year teachers? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Living uh, and learning through this pandemic in their first year of teaching. Yes, um, definitely. I would like to share with you because... Of course, at one point in time, I was a first year teacher. Mm -hmm. And if I had known some of the things that I know now, uh, it would have been so helpful to me. 
I almost quit my first year after teaching. It's like all of this time I devoted my time to college and wanting to teach. And that first year was like, I can't do this. It's just too much. So for first year teachers or first through three years of teaching, the most important thing I will share with you, and I know you've heard this, but it is mm. dire, it's critical, is building relationships. Building a relationship, not only with your students, but with your parents. Mm -hmm. That is so important. I learned that early. Some parents do not get called until something is wrong. Mm -hmm. I changed that in my classroom. I called a parent at one point in time and to give a good news break. And the first thing the parents said to me is, what do you want? Why are you calling my house? What has she done now? And I said, oh no. I said, this is a good news conversation. I said, she was great today. What? It changed her entire attitude. Call your parents, say something good about their child before you make that first call of something negative. Mm -hmm. Call your parent meet them talk with them say something positive because they need to hear that they love their child mm -hmm. and they need to hear something positive so building relationships with your parents once you do that when you do make that call i guarantee you they will support you 100 percent. like oh no i know miss dukes so i know whatever she said she's telling the truth don't tell me anything else and that's exactly. what they say. Yeah. So that's important. Next, those first two weeks, even when you go back to school from virtual learning, mm -hmm. those first two weeks, don't try to push work. Build relationships. And an easy way to do that is I would like for you to get a three ring binder. For the teachers, give all of your students the little flat journals, the little black journals or whatever color that you have, give them a journal. Instruct them to go around the room and select a person that they will interview. You will give them guiding questions. And after that, they will come up with questions on their own based on their conversations. But everyone in that class will interview each other and you in the process will also be involved by interviewing students as well but yours will be in your three ring binder theirs will be in their journals once you finish you will know that child's favorite color you know mm -hmm. that child has a pet that they love you know what their favorite foods you know what makes them upset and what helps them to calm down that's building relationships. I it teaches that. empathy because mm -hmm. the kids will get to know each other as well. Oh, well, I know why Karen is doing that. She's biting her nails because such and such. The little things are so important and it builds a community. And when kids know that you care, they want to impress you. They want to do whatever they can to please you. They're gonna do their work. Mm -hmm. They're gonna respect each other. And you know what, in that process, what you're also learning, you're finding out who your leaders are in your classroom. You're finding out your musicians, your artists, your writers, your comedians. You're find, finding out your politicians. You're finding out those that love to sing or dance. All of these things you're finding out just through these little interviews and the kids are learning and bonding with each other. Think about the typical, typical classroom. Kids come in, they sit down, they sit in rows by their last names usually. They sit there to the end of class, teacher calls the roll and they leave. What type of interaction or bonding actually takes place? In fact, I would love for us to
to stop using the 18th century style of teaching because we're still using the same classroom setting Thanks. we used in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. Get rid of that. Mm -hmm. How many of you have seen the desk that actually will go up and down and they roll? Isn't that awesome if the kids had something similar where if they want to stand up and do their work, yeah. They're not getting in trouble because they're standing up, but they can actually roll, push up their desk and stand up and work, or they can roll the desk over to the window or in a corner or somewhere else in the room and still do their work. Or if you assign a group, they don't have to leave their belongings one place or try to tug their belongings to another place, but they still have their desk so they can move everything with them as they go. Stop this i don't know how to say it um just say it <laughs> say it dr kim offend <laughs> the education system but oh my gosh this oh. is the time where it needs to be offended because this is the time for change oh i it, it's it's i'm i'm so upset that we have not moved from this setting so we still have the basic gray and green colored walls in the school. And we know research has stated to us over and over again that colors promote learning. The right colors promote learning, just yeah. like they can promote anger. You don't want a lot of reds in your room because that promotes anger. But the calming colors, the pastel colors, if a child walks into a classroom that is not the basic structured classroom, they want to be there. They want to learn. They get excited. Learning and that brain activity starts, those wheels start turning. People do not know, but by the child, by the time a child reaches three years old, they have their brain cells are fully developed to the point where they have more synapses than their average pediatrician, mm -hmm. but they need affirmations and not prohibitions. And a child that lives in a home that's constantly uh, getting put downs, it affects their brain cells. Mm -hmm. So we need healthy brain cells. And of course, I'm doing research on that as well, because it's just fascinating to me. That's another topic we can discuss. <laughs> yes, so many things. I just love hearing your stories. And you said 33 years of practical teaching experience and school yes. counseling experience. So just like sitting at your feet, taking it all in. And Irene has added some things in the chat, just commenting what you said about the importance of those good news calls and how that changes the attitudes of the parents, how it yes. changes the attitudes of the kids themselves. Yes. yes. And one of the things that I talk about a lot is how we're all on the same team. It's team kid. Yes. We have to stop making school and home adversarial. Right. We're making school authoritarian over. Right. And, and that's one of the beautiful things I think is possible through this pandemic is that we're seeing communities come around one another yes the success of the family and the child instead of saying well i'm the school and you better do what i say you know so right. this is so good this is yes. so good and you talked about fostering empathy i love that idea of, of student interviews and teacher interviews and the colorful classrooms it reminds me of uh, articles I've read about teachers making their classrooms feel more like a coffee shop. Yes. I mean, I think about how we as adults learn or how we as adults work. We want comfortable environments where we can relax or drink a cup of coffee or, you know, it's just, it's a different age. It's a different day. And, and part of the beauty of that comes from technology and how we can engage with technology and still engage with one another, whether it's in a remote setting or whether it's in a structured setting. So this is this is good. This is so good. So what what closing thoughts do you have for us, Dr. Kim? Well, um, I would like to say one thing that um, 
the kids shared with me when I was a school counselor uh, in Metro schools, when they walked into my classroom, it was always different. I had changed things around. Uh, I actually had um, coming in a booth because a restaurant had closed and I, <laughs> I asked them, could I have one of their booths? And they go in and they asked why. I said, because I need it in my classroom. I say, I, you know, I just have different settings in there. And I had one station that actually had a hot dog stand where the hot dogs roll over like the old time in the movies. So making your classroom inviting to the students. Uh, I had brain breaks. We would do a lesson and all of a sudden I go, okay, brain break. And I may turn on some music and say, okay, you can go in that area if you want. And they would dance and they would come back and then they would start their work. They loved it. You know, so you have to cater to your students' needs and what they need. That's very important because that's when you will get the most out of them. I have some favorite free resource sites that I would like to share. You may or may not know about them, but I want to share them with you quickly. Let's see. Um, one is Common Sense. I don't know if you've uh, heard of Common Sense, but it's teacher created. Uh, another one um, is um, Share My Lessons, and they have lessons on there already created by teachers. Uh, another one is Learning for Justice. This actually talks about, uh, and they won Emmy Awards and Oscar Awards for their curriculum. But if you ever want to teach a lesson about social justice, Learning for Justice, you, it used to be Teaching Tolerance. Mm -hmm. but they've changed your name to learning for justice but you have love in the big world you have uh sanford harmony you have so many resources available and that's important that you tap into your resources i know you all know about kahoot and you know about jeopardy and uh you know about family feud uh, but these are what kids enjoy they enjoy the competition they enjoyed learning in different ways. Tap into the ways that they learn. Make it fun. Teaching doesn't have to be boring, nor learning. Right. Make and it fun. I love that. And I, I'm just listening to you talk. I'm like, I know, now I know why we're such kindred spirits. Because the passion that you have and that element of play that you infuse with everything that you do with students and families too it's just yeah if it's not fun it's really not worth doing not. and your kids would not be engaged or motivated and that's what it's all about we're in this together absolutely absolutely well thank so. you so much dr kim for sharing your experiences and your stories of the from the students and families this year and for encouraging us all you have truly lifted us up with your wisdom and your practical tips for how we can re-engage with students as they're coming back into classrooms or continuing virtual learning but like you said it's all about building those healthy relationships so thank, thank you, so you for inviting me and thank you all for joining us Yes, thank you. And friends, we'll see you next time here with the LBW Educate You podcast. My name is Tamara and be sure to check out loveinabigworld.org for some of those resources that Dr. Kim talked about. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.